I'm Charlotte Davenport. I'm here at the Ava Gallery at 11 Bank Street in Lebanon with Adam Blue, whose work is surrounding us. And uh, we have an opportunity to talk with Adam about his work. And you still have time to come and see this exhibit. It's on until, what's the date of the, the closing? 24th. 24th of May. So be sure to come in and look at it firsthand with your own eyes. And um, meanwhile, Adam, do you want to tell us how you ended up here in Lebanon, New Hampshire? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I moved out in the uh, summer of 2006, towards the end of the summer. Um, I went to Dartmouth, so I um, graduated in 93. So I lived mm -hmm. here 15 years ago for about for four years. And um, my wife is from the area. She also went to Dartmouth. And when we had our daughter, we moved here to um, be closer to family. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, we were, um, I had an art practice in San Francisco and mm -hmm. have been making work there for the past 10 years. Well, it's quite a switch to come here. I'm glad you did. <laughs> it is. So let's begin by um, having you talk with us about the first section of this show. The title of the overall show is? Is Fragments. Right. Uh, and what I'm sharing um, in this show is um, segments of past shows that I've had in the uh, three years prior. Um, the first fragment is from a body of abstract painting that I made. The second fragment, fragment is from the um, updated Broke Cartouche series. And the third fragment is Hamilton Stillwell Collection, 1916 to 1918. And the final uh, is most useful painting ever made in a, hi in a history that arguably doesn't exist. So we'll get to that in a minute. Well, why don't we start with this uh, first fragment over here. The, this first section um, is charcoal on paper and very um, unique. The references is that um, Adam can explain more clearly. When I first saw them, I was just intrigued with your work as an artist and hadn't begun to put together uh, the whole philosophy or aesthetic that you're referring to. So maybe you'd share some of that with the television yeah. people. Uh, what I've tried to do, or what I've taken on in the past number of years with this project is I've tried to investigate different modes um, of painting, particularly in American painting, st um, starting with these abstracts. And I don't know how familiar everybody is necessarily with the way that we arrived at abstract painting in the 50s, so I'll just give a, a brief, sort of a brief summary. We had um, in the 19th century the importance of, of making works that um, were representational and specifically very volumetric um, and very rendered. So portraiture, landscape, still life, all genres that were, you know, in a sense almost liberated or replaced by the camera. With the introduction of the camera, it all of a sudden afforded painters to begin to explore a different vocabulary of marks, um, different gestures, and, and start to move away from trying to directly represent the, the things that they were capturing. Uh, as the gestures got more grand, as the um, instinct became more in sort of the sculptural play with working with paint, direct subject disappeared and painters used the act of painting as their expression. And, and so the energy that began to be introduced in painting, importantly as light when it was rendering, became the energy of the maker, almost a, um, a spiritual energy or a, or a chi energy. And as the instinct to produce very volumetric and, and rendered forms dissolved, there was the instinct to move towards the creation of flat spaces inside of painting. And uh, these are the two kind of fundamental tensions that I, I tried to seek to explore in, in my abstract work. Um, I asked myself, how is it possible for me to create tension that exists between uh, flat spaces and volumetric spaces? And then, you know, the first question, exactly how does, how does light travel through an abstract space? 
And maybe the, the best way to sort of point this out in, in, in terms of my thinking about the work is if we look at in, inside of this piece, you'll notice that there is a, you know, in, in, a, in a traditional sense, the light source always comes from, would come from the top left and then it would cast shadows down. Um, in these spaces, sometimes I threw the shadows that came off of these sort of lollipop forms in different directions and, and oftentimes, you know, the shadow, the way that we see a shadow inside of a work is the way that we understand how the volume, the volume works. Here, these objects in the back, the shadows fall forward. So trying to maintain that kind of, of a sensibility and then also the, a sense of energy working abstractly. Um, sort of some of the power in, in some of the marks I try to erase vigorously and, and mark vigorously and, and just let it build over time. The, um, these larger paintings take approximately three months to, to, to create. And in this one, again, sort of conceiving of, of how I was trying to work for the tension between flat spaces and volumetric spaces. Some of these gestures, these fields, communicate a sort of flatness and yet these blue arc creates a volume or in, in the case of this painting which is titled Fulcrum. What is the title again? This is um, titled Fulcrum. Mm -hmm. We have what is this volumetric sort of energy cloud that is this, this very worked area with lots of wings and geometries and then it sits on this point here and then all of the marks in the base are intended to be communicate a kind of flatness like how, how can this, this cloud of energy sit on this point mm -hmm. that it runs parallel to the wall. And the same in this piece with sort of the application of shadow coming in this way and then the shadow coming in this way on these two triangular forms. The very energetic mark making as opposed to a s sort of slower pacing in some of the fields up here. And I can see that this is a very conscious uh, way of working for you. When pre this work, had you explored abstraction in a less um, deliberate manner where because uh, sometimes you see young people, I'm thinking as an uh -huh. undergraduate, were you a painter? Did you paint abstractly? Did you uh, do, you know, minimalist work? What, what, what was your first kind uh, of um, love in painting? Yeah, I, um, the majority of my really, of my, how I came into um, drawing and painting is my, my background is in biology and so I spent, oh, interesting. yeah, I spent many years um, growing up rendering images that I was looking at through microscopes. Oh. And so um, because I did a lot of detailed drawing and, and really with a, a particular consciousness directed at, at, the, at the micro, mm -hmm. I think for me to get into a space where I was working larger scale and more abstractly mm -hmm. gave me, I don't know, the, uh, the instinct to participate in, in, Very interesting. in, this, mm -hmm. in this sort of language. Yes. So there is, I mean, there is attention to the, to that sort of the sense of scale, I think, that still comes through with the, some mm -hmm. of the smaller marks mm -hmm. and some of the, some of the way that I try to gesture the, also the large and the small simultaneously. Yeah, it's an interesting aspect. Yeah. That background, I think. Very interesting. Uh, this section, this uh, second fragment part of the show, for me, um, I have to admit, I came and I really puzzled over it all by myself. And then act, after talking to Adam, I became very, very intrigued with um, his intention in this work. So I'm going to let him do the talking and stand back. It's a wonderful wall of work and uh, has gotten me thinking a lot. You want to talk about it for us, Adam? Yeah. Um, so after really investing heavily in in making abstracts for many years, I um, sort of came to the conclusion that I was 
really nesting my, um, my art practice inside of the aesthetic of, of modernity and if I was going to make a switch it would be appropriate for me to embrace some of the um, philosophy and the aesthetics of postmodernity as a project and whereas modernism um, sort of came from depending on, on loosely how you want to chart it sort of 1880 to 1950 there seemed to it seemed to be building towards this one single master narrative and we achieved a sort of sense of completion when the works from that period were displayed and, and taken and, and moved through um, the you know the world from New York at all the way out and around the world. When I started thinking about how to approach postmodernity as a concept, you know postmodernity largely is a reaction to the tenets of modernity. Modernity being the pursuit of this abstract language, a sort of a language that um, is, from a humanist perspective is sort of a pre-cultural language. Postmodernity as a reaction to that as more intent to elaborate on context and sort of celebrate the differences that come from different cultures and from different backgrounds and recognize that you know it's not necessarily to everyone's advantage to pretend like we all know the same things fundamentally because the way that we are is, is a very important sort of culture the, the presence of culture is, is specific and important. And so this body of work um, is titled the updated Baroque cartouche series and, and in thinking about art history you know the, the Baroque was the period that stretched many of the ideas that came up in the Renaissance and the way that representation functioned and so I figured you know perhaps the postmodern period should then be an extension of modernity and the, the cartouche that stated the cartouche um, as a form is, a, is li quite literally a frame and it, and it goes back in the um, 18th century oftentimes painters would make a work on commission and then before they could hand it over to the um, individual who had you know purchased it they would need to get it a frame and the frames would be too expensive or the craftspeople that would make them wouldn't be available and so they would take their painting that they produced and they would bring it into the house they would install it on the wall and then taking their paint kit they would go to the, that space and then they would render the illusion of a frame that would surround the piece itself and what we come to see is that a lot of artists began having more fun making the frames perhaps than they did actually the work itself and whereas the, there would be little pudi or cherub, um, cherubim that would be surrounding inside of the frame you know if the, if the original painting was about a, a bountiful hunting year then the painter when they were making the frame the illusion of the frame would perhaps you know put a bunch of feast scenes and, and all of the there would be stags and does and bountiful crops and, and what you get is the frame becomes an opportunity for the narrative of the piece itself to be to grow and so that was the that was the driving thought process that I had Adam, with one this of the, work. Adam, one of the best places to start visually I think is looking at these small um, at the drawings. drawings. These three are really intriguing to me because they cover such a wide range of uh, history really yeah <laughs> and so maybe you could discuss those and yeah this first one um, is is called cherub with gun cartouche and as I was working on <clears throat> as I was working on making these images I started with you know the literalism of taking those antiquated pieces and then trying to reset the characters into more contemporary context and so in this individual drawing we have <clears throat> one cherub has a gun and points it at the another this one has a camera and is sort of participating in an act of surveillance we have one that's talking on a cell phone and another with, that's sitting with their laptop and then we have some others that are participating in the act of construction actually building this out and so as I made these started making these you know the questions became bigger for me like well you know if I'm going to have these little um, angels doing this then 
you know, why actually do I need to have angels at all? And started letting it grow. And when I was a child growing up, I didn't spend a lot of time necessarily looking at, at works like this with the pootie and the sort of elaborate fanfare, but I did spend a lot of time at the video arcade. And so in this other drawing, we have Donkey Kong and uh, Super Mario and Miss Pac-Man and Qbert running around on the Escher stairs. And then in the one below, we have um, the ascension of St. Francis as Princess Leia, and we have St. Francis kneeling, receive, being touched by the light of God, and then we also have R2-D2 coming in on the other side and projecting him from that space, and Krusty the clown in the poster. And this wall takes us even further into um, all kinds of references that are familiar to many people, and when we see this piece, go, oh, Agnes Martin, but then there's this one little area, and then, again, thinking about what is the frame and what is the yeah. content. Um, and all of these have references, really, into familiar territory to a lot of people in terms of our recent art history. Yeah, for this piece that, that appears as, as perhaps as abstract as any, you know, the, qu the question became for me, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to be making accessible all of this visual vocabulary from the past, then it, I ought to actually be able to use some of the visual vocabulary of modernism itself. And so what are the extremes, I asked myself, and those would be um, a reference to Ryman, who made all white paintings, and to Reinhardt, who made all black paintings, sort of as the extreme gestures, and then Agnes Martin in the, in the piece in the middle. And then I put them all so that they rest against the wall here in the manner of uh, Kosuth. Adam, do you, would, you, would you discuss these three? Just, they're so colorful and attractive in their own way, but then in the context, they're uh -huh. much more interesting. Yeah. So when you describe them, it's more fun uh, to look. Thank you, yeah. This one um, is called a Fountain, a Cross-Cultural Time Cartouche. And in it, I aspired to represent sort of more the Baroque period at the top with the pudi and the, the sort of flagging banner that comes across in the mirror. And then in the bottom, I chose this more cubist palette and try to have it be flatter, more 20th century. And then at the top, I chose a more graphic element to have the heavy outlines and all of the you know, more tertiary colors. Um, this piece is, is sort of plays with um, Bruce Nauman's work. Mm -hmm. Nauman did the neon light bulb question pieces, and I think that his original asked something like, um, you know, makes a comment that an artist helps us see the world or reveals an ult ult is the individual who reveals sort of ultimate truths. And for me, I'm kind of playing with that concept. And here, this neon light bulb says, ask yourself, have you ever been a tree in a play? And so the, the, <laughs> the sense is that, you know, have you, what is the human experience of being a frame? You know, inside of the theater, if, there, if you've ever been a tree, you really are not the actor, but you are the stage <laughs> itself. And so again, playing with the concept of frame. And this piece down here is, um, the full title is Perpe Perpetual Motion Machine in Collapsed Space Cartouche. And in it we have two chess pieces that could never capture one another because to move into that space is to make it, to move into a space where it could challenge would make itself vulnerable. And then we have an elephant that busts through the wall scaring the mice in to the hole that are responsible for scaring the elephant out in the first place. <laughs> Thank you. Kind of playful. <laughs> oh, that is fun. So the, the thing that I ask myself then um, is, and this is important, I think, for me and for everyone to consider, is that if, if modernity was the process that, that had its aesthetic peak in the 50s, and postmodernity largely um, was a project that had its aesthetic peak in the 80s. We're almost 30 years past then. It's important, I think, for all of us to ponder exactly where we are now. Mm -hmm. And how, how has this transi transition punctuated things? Um, how do we look at the world now? And, and 
how is it that we can make sense of our own contemporary aesthetic decisions. So, and does that lead us to these last two sections in terms of your work and yeah, your exploration? I think, I think mm -hmm. it does. Um, this fragment is called the Hamilton Stillwell Collection, 1916 to 1918. And as I was working on the cartouches, I came to the conclusion that the frame itself became a literalism. And for this piece, I wanted to try and investigate, you know, perhaps the frame now in which we should work is not, not the literal frame, but the frame that is the, the way that we display artworks it, in, them, in and of themselves. So rather than being the artist for this body of work, uh, I'm playing the role of curator. And so the, the, the essence of this body of work is that I found these pieces, I've, I've built a sort of a, a museum style presentation in which there is a a pamphlet with a threefold and a, and a portrait and a poster and then the work itself. Um, so I built the narrative of this individual named Hamilton Stilwell who was an eccentric pseudo outcast to the Cornish colony and the, the backstory that I made um, was that I located, I found all of this work in an ab abandoned outbuilding in, down in Cornish and that it was perhaps his incendiary temper or perhaps the fact that he worked in a, in a manner that was so different than all the way that everybody worked here a century ago that nobody knew about anything that he did. And so now we're just having the opportunity to bring it to light the first time. So when you enter this particular fragment, either from that end or this end, there's this wonderful, mysterious story in this folder with a picture of Hamilton Stillwell. And I came with a granddaughter, and we read this. And I found it also really fun to read this story. It's, it's um, a delightful narrative. And for me, it felt really quite real for me. <laughs> so I want to warn people that when you come here, there's something familiar about the past and about particularly what people might have done in a regional area, trying to pick up on some of the things that maybe world-renowned artists had been doing, especially if they'd only seen them in small formats like books. So it has that wonderful aspect as well. And it's a, a fun part of the show, so pick up the folder if you come. Yeah, it is an important part to spend the time with the story. Um, this, this piece merges text with the visual um, in a way that, that really helps to complete it. So I do, I do encourage everybody to be sure and read it and, and enjoy it. It's a lark. So this final piece is called uh, Most Useful Painting Ever Made in a History That Arguably Doesn't Exist. And, and, and building now on the concept of history that we had in the Hamilton Stillwell fragment, I want to sort of address the way that you know, we, we need to constantly remind ourselves that history is a construct that as much as we want to believe in, in its absolute nature, it is something that we are constantly reinventing and, and making for ourselves. And so for this project, um, it's more of a philosophical project, I decided there's, you know, if there is a, fund of, a sort of a basic level, people oftentimes believe that, you know, art by definition need be useless. And if it has any use, then it can't be art. So playing with that concept, I decided to make a painting that is entirely useful. And um, <laughs> beginning with that idea, I would start to try and represent it in the way that is the least material, and then bring it through all of its material phases of representation until it eventually exited all the way back at, out as immaterial. So the first part of the process was um, text and writing as very abstract. Uh, drawing, and then objects, and this hung in my studio and does hang in my studio when not on display, and I do use all of these pieces all the time. It's my Leatherman and my car keys and sunglasses, so it's all part of my daily life is inside of this piece. And then after the objects themselves, I went to an oil painting rendering, and then a um, digital photograph printed to scale 
to a 35 millimeter slide projected as light and then ultimately the entire piece is captured here again as binary little electrons inside of a disk. And what I hope is that with this piece that we have the instinct to see that it, though it started as an idea and ended as an idea never are any of them ever identical and never can any of them be closer to the idea than any of the others because they're all representations and not the things themselves. Well I hope you've all enjoyed being here with Adam and looking at the work with him because that's the best way to experience this show. Um, you'll have a wonderful time by yourself but you also can go online to Adam A. Blue, all one word, dot com oh. and he has a wonderful website which is um, easy to use and ex gives you some more ideas that come from this imaginative artist. Thank you. Thank you.